All right, so um, let's continue. Um, now I'd like to look into different standards, uh, a few examples of what we actually use every day and how they fit into this, this model. First of all, um, uh, a side note, this layer usually has, this has seven layers, this model, and sometimes people, if people talk about layer eight, then this is supposed to mean the user, which is on top of the rest. Um, that's not actually part of the, of the official model, but if you ever hear that mentioned, then layer eight actually refers to the, to the user. So I've already m mentioned that Wi-Fi is on the, on the lowest two layers. Uh, on the other hand, Bluetooth actually spans the entire stack. Um, UMTS, uh, for the most part, uh, or all the, all the uh, cellular networks actually, for the most part, are only in the those three layers, but they also, uh, parts of them actually go up to maybe layer six. And Wi-Fi is actually the simplest one of those. It's just on the lowest two layers, just was what we discussed previously. So um, maybe brief summary of how Bluetooth uh, actually works. So I've already mentioned this is a personal area network and uh, it's, across the whole stack. For that reason, the specification is very complex. Uh, the most recent version is, I think, 4.2. That's probably even larger. The latest uh, one I've checked was 4.0, and that's already 2,300 pages. And if you build a uh, Bluetooth-capable smartphone, for example, then you somehow actually have to implement everything specified in those pages, or at least a large part of it. Um, for that reason, yeah, it's very complex, and so it's also quite error-prone, uh, often not quite as well implemented as you would like, but uh, at some point within those 2,300 pages, you will start to make one or two errors, probably. So the so-called air interface for Bluetooth, where it actually transmits the data, um, is in the ISM band. We actually uh, talked about these last time. So these are license-free bands where everyone's allowed to transmit. But of course, that also means you get lots of noise and lots of interference. Um, this is divided into 80 channels of one megahertz bandwidth, and it uses this freak, uh, this, uh, frequency hopping, frequency hopping spread spectrum method. So it rapidly switches between those 80 channels in a more or less random sequence, but random in such a way that the receiver uh, is able to pick out the correct channel for, uh, for a transmission and, uh, and switch to that basically in lockstep with the uh, transmitter. Um, you can get up to three megabit from Bluetooth, so it's not really for uh, highly efficient data transmissions. It's just for very uh, low bandwidth data streams like audio to your headset, for example, or maybe sending a picture, a single one, uh, to another device. That's the, the area which Bluetooth is targeted towards. What's also important is that uh, um, somewhat recently there has been an update to that specification, 4.0, as I've mentioned, and that actually introduces a second substandard, Bluetooth Low Energy, which doesn't really have anything to do with the original Bluetooth. So it's still part of the same document, it's still called Bluetooth, but in terms of what's actually transmitted, it's entirely different. Uh, the reason is that this is uh, entirely optimized for a better battery life and low energy consumption. So, um, for example, if you have like a Fitbit, uh, a smart smartwatch, all that stuff uses uh, Bluetooth low energy, of course, to conserve battery. And um, if you have like a, a connection between your headset and your, your smartphone, then that uses the regular Bluetooth standard. Um, again, they're still part of the same specification. And for that reason, most modern devices support both at the same time. So um, the hardware is there, and uh, I think since Android 4.4 or something, uh, the operating system, for example, supports it too. Same for iOS since, I think, iOS 7. Um, so in theory, most devices should support both. In some specialized devices, 
like, for example, smartwatches actually only support the low energy variant to, to conserve power. Um, all right, so much for Bluetooth, just as a brief overview. Now let's look into uh, Wi-Fi. So um, everybody is using it, I guess, almost daily. So uh, this is a big family of different standards, 802.11. Um, with some letter at the end, the letter usually denotes which, which um, basically iteration of the protocol it is. So you have A, B, G, N, A, N, and whatnot. Um, the important part is here again, you have, uh, they are also in the ISM bands, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Um, so for example, they may, might actually interfere with Bluetooth because it uses the same frequency range in the ISM band again. For that reason, the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi radios are often actually integrated. So you get one single device, which is uh, built into your mobile device, which does both standards at the same time and has uh, basically knows when the Wi-Fi is transmitting. So it briefly pauses the Bluetooth part when they operate at the same time, for example. So you don't get interference, even if they're in the same frequency band. Um, there's actually a provision in Bluetooth that you can uh, uh, basically set up a, con a connection between devices using Bluetooth and then switch to Wi-Fi for the data transmission so that you can use the much higher data rate of Wi-Fi. In theory, uh, the current standards support 780 megabit, but that's probably just if you're exactly one meter away from the router and there's no other devices and no microwave ovens in, in the neighborhood and so on. So uh, in, in reality, you can, under good conditions, maybe get uh, 100 megabits with current standards. Of course, there's uh, lots of work being done uh, into transmitting upwards of one, two, five, maybe even 10 gigabits, but that's not something you can get uh, you can get outside of the lab yet. So current state of the art is maybe something around 100 megabits, which you can reliably transfer uh, wirelessly using Wi-Fi. So I've already mentioned this. Wi-Fi is just on the, on the lowest layer, so it doesn't actually care about network protocols at all. It just cares about getting data between, between the access point and the devices. It uses depending on what standard you actually have, it either uses the simple time-based collision sensing method, or it uses a direct sequence spread spectrum with this pseudo-random bit, bit sequence, or it uses the orthogonal frequency division uh, method, which is also uh, related to the code access me method, actually. What it also does, what's quite interesting, I think, is that the newer standards are able to use multiple input, multiple output uh, uh, approaches. We briefly mentioned these last time. This means that you have several antennas in each device, and if you have different pathways uh, that which the uh, radio waves can take, for example, of course, you have the straight path, and then you have some reflections, and uh, the different antennas can then adapt each one to one specific path and use several of them at once without interference uh, to increase the data rate again. Um, so this is the physical layer. And on the data link layer, we have stuff like uh, the actual announcement of what the, the name of the Wi-Fi network is. So this is part of the data link layer. And we have switching between different access points also. So if you use EduRoam, of course, then you're not always connected to one and the same access point. If you move to a different room in the same building, then you will probably already have to switch to a different, different router. And that should, of course, work seamlessly. So this is something that's still managed on this very low data link layer by the access points and the devices uh, themselves. And uh, also encryption. You may uh, remember, perhaps, that it took a few tries for this encryption to, to uh, get right. So there was this uh, WEP standard, which is, was, was horribly insecure, and there was WPA afterwards, which also wasn't perfect, and currently we're at uh, WPA2, I think, which is kind of kind of enough for for day-to-day -day security. But um, 
yeah, this is part of the standard, and again, it took, took a few tries to actually get that right. So the big advantage of Wi-Fi here when you compare it to Bluetooth is that you have a couple of substandards, but they're very well separated. So you have the very low um, data rate, uh, 11 megabits, very old standard, for example, and you can just implement that and still talk to a modern access point or you can uh, successively upgrade to higher standards and higher data rates. So um, this is maybe one of the reasons why Wi-Fi is often a bit more reliable than Bluetooth because you don't have this huge block of different interlocking uh, standards. You just have mostly separate ones. All right, so um, up to this point, any questions about, yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So the first one, like, up here involves Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Is Bluetooth kind of redundant at the moment? Like, um, it's using the same frequency and basically kind of the same, and uh, Wi-Fi can just make uh, more data and faster? Yes, so I think. I think Bluetooth is mostly still there because even the regular Bluetooth standard still consumes less power than Wi-Fi. So because it has, at, at the very most, I think Bluetooth has 10 meters of range. Uh, so you can get uh, devices with higher range, but uh, for regular smartphones, they have the low power transmitters and after 10 meters, they're, they're basically, uh, they're gone. So, and for Wi-Fi, you usually, uh, easily can cover, I, I don't know, maybe 50 meters. So it, just for purely physical reasons, it uses more power. And that's one reason why Bluetooth is still there. And also the low energy variant of Bluetooth, uh, yeah, it's really optimized for, for uh, power consumption. So that's even more of the same advantage, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another is 5 gigahertz, and I noticed that the 5 gigahertz one has the smaller range uh -huh. than the 2.4. Is that problem with my router, or is it just the limitation of the technology? Um, phew, that kind of goes into the direction of physics. I think um, um, the 5 gigahertz uh, radiation is more easily absorbed, for example, by walls and so on. So it's uh, for the for the 2.4, it's still pretty easy to go through, through, yeah, through walls, through wood, and so on. And I think five gigahertz, the higher the band, uh, the, the higher the frequency, the more easily it's absorbed by uh, by by physical materials. So I, that might be the reason. But hmm? okay, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a moment. Um, so usually I think because they use quite different modulation methods. So even if you have, uh, even if both would use this, so yeah, no, of course, of course, that's the point. Uh, Bluetooth, for example, uses frequency hopping sp spread spectrum. So it switches between channels rapidly. And Wi-Fi, on the other hand, uh, so the higher higher bandwidth uh, variants of Wi-Fi, they use this uh, spread spectrum method. So um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So for exactly so for Bluetooth, it rapidly switches between different channels, and the receiver just has to switch along with the uh, with the transmitter because they agree on the same sequence up front and then they, they switch at the same time simply. And for uh, Wi-Fi, for example, uses this method. And um, so the receiver can, um, can basically, uh, it, it doesn't actually get, that, get disturbed that much by the Bluetooth transmission. So the Bluetooth transmi transmission has, has a higher energy, but only on a very, uh, when very small uh, uh, band of the spectrum. And the Wi-Fi has lower energy, but spread out over a, a wider range, for example. And for that reason, if the, um, 
I can't tell for sure if, for example, uh, common, common uh, Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth modules has actually two antennas, for e one for each function. Can't tell for sure, but usually they have at least two antennas, for example, so they can transmit and receive at the same time. And I'm pretty sure they can also, for example, receive on both antennas at the same time on different frequencies. And that is one reason why it's actually possible to, to separate the two again afterwards. Okay, um, more questions?